All right, well, hey, good morning, uh, Rebecca. Thank you. Uh, I, told the, I told the first service, I was like, Rebecca just needs to get up here and preach. She's going to talk like that every week. I mean, my goodness. I mean, come on, let's go, right? Let's, let's go. Uh, hey, thanks for being here this morning. Uh, it's been a great day. We've had some baptisms over in the sanctuary, so uh, I was there for the, just the first part of that service, and uh, we've got some baptism in our, in our, uh, baptisms in our Spanish service uh, after this, so Really great day, a uh, really great day across our campus, and I'm excited that you're here uh, today as we just continue in our uh, series, The Gospel According to Matthew. I don't, know, uh, I don't know if you're like me, but I haven't been to a movie theater in I don't know how long, and mostly that's because all of the movies just come directly into my living room, so I don't feel like I have to go out to the movie theater, but I also feel like um, all of the movie trailers that are out there just reveal everything that I need to know. It's like, I don't really think I need to watch this. I already see, I already see what's going to kind of happen here. Or if you spend any time with middle school boys, like I did this past week, I have no need to go watch the Batman. Okay. They've, they told me everything, right? It just happens. That's right. But when you, because when you know it's when what, when you know what's going to happen, uh, such as you know every Marvel movie. Oh hey, oh, the good guys won again. Are you kidding? Kind of changes the whole way you view the movie, right? Every twist and turn or tough situation is really seen in a in a different light, right? It gives you a completely different perspective uh, on the movie. When you know the end, when you know who wins, it changes everything. And that's really what we're going to look at today. We're going to see kind of this upcoming attraction where God gives a preview of what's to come uh, to really to, to for help us, just, just to help us be encouraged and to give us perspective really when we lose perspective. And so what I'm praying for today is that we, we can see a little more of Jesus. Maybe you're introduced to him today, or maybe that your love, your desire, your affection um, can just grow deeper with him, to, uh, with him today. So uh, Jesus, let us... Let us make much of you today. Help me to make much of you today. May you be magnified in this service now, the rest of this time, as we look at Matthew 17. But God, may you be magnified as we go and live out our lives this week. So if you have your Bibles, uh, go to Matthew 17. We're going to be Matthew 17, 1 through 13. Again, looking at the transfiguration of Jesus. And really, the transfiguration just reveals that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, and he's now Lord of all. And someday we will see him in his glory. And so what we're going to see is that sometimes we need perspective. So Matthew 17, if you have your Bibles or you have your phone, it'll be on the screen. Uh, But follow along uh, with me as we read this together. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good that we're here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a a bright cloud overshadowed them, and and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces, and they were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Hey, rise, have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. You might want to star that one. It's an important part of our message today. No one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, hey, tell no one of the vision until the Son of Man is is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, then then why do the scribes say that that first Elijah must come? He answered, Elijah does come, and he he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them, of John the Baptist. Again, if this is your first time with us or you've, maybe you've been out, uh, we're walking through the book of Matthew and really we're just looking at Jesus' kingship. We've, we've looked at the gene- genealogy of the king. We've seen his coronation with his baptism. We've looked at his reign, which was last week, and today it's all about his glory. 
And really, when Matthew's writing this, he's writing this for a, really a Jewish audience. He, he's, uh, he's, he's showing us that Jesus is king. He's the Messiah. Messiah really means it's the anointed one, but it's, it's the liberating king. And so many of Matthew's contemporaries just refused to believe Jesus was the Messiah. Being a tax collector, like he had all these friends, he had all these people he knew that were, that were Pharisees and Sadducees. They were the religious leaders of the day. And they continually rejected him as the one who was to come and reign. And so as Jesus retreats, this time he takes the three, these three core disciples and with him he's just transfigured. And so some would say that this is actually one of four major events in Jesus' life after his birth. You have his baptism, you have the transfiguration, you have his crucifixion, and then you have the resurrection. And in those last, kind of these last three weeks, you have John the Baptist who's kind of slowly tying all of these things together. And so Peter, James, and John are there. These, these three disciples have significance for a few reasons. You see Jesus with these three men uh, a lot of times. And so they're, they're three of the first four disciples called by Jesus. Uh, they're three key church leaders. I mean, James is killed very early as a martyr which is kind of key to what's kind of what Jesus starts talking about in terms of persecution. All three witness Jesus raising the dead girl. I mean, they're present here in the transfiguration. I mean, you see Peter write about it in 2 Peter 1, 16 through 18, where he's like, look, I'm not making this up. I'm not talking about some sort of mystery or some sort of crazy story. Like I've seen the glory of the Lord. And then they also accompany Jesus in, in Gethsemane on the night before his crucifixion. And so Jesus leads these core disciples to a high unknown mountain, right? We don't know, it's maybe Mount Hermon, Mount Tabor. Like if it was important, they probably would have put it in the, put it in the text, but that's, it's, it's just not important. The point is they were led up and he's transfigured. And so there's three points I want us to see as we kind of move through this scene. And I say scene because we're actually going to spend some time in Matthew 16 just kind of recapping what happens there because I really think that's what sets up 17. And so that first point we see is that one is that we lose perspective. We lose perspective. We lose perspective on life. We lose perspective on what God's, uh, God's trying to do. And so in, in 17.1, Jesus allows for pause with these six days. It reminds me of the, the Powerade commercial that's been floating around during the NCAA tournament, right? The pause is power, right? I just see that. I don't watch that much TV, I promise, but I just see this commercial over and over and over again. I'm like, can you, can you get something else? Like, you got anything else out there? Jesus models this often though. He's taking, he's taking a break. He's, he's pausing so he can rest and he can reset. And he finds a mountain and he went, he, where he would go away by himself, or in this case, he goes with the three disciples. And like I said, it's, it's kind of following Matthew 6, 16, where six days later is actually six days after 16, 28. And so a lot happens in, in Matthew 16. And I think what happens is that, is that the disciples are just really overwhelmed and they're really really confused about everything that's happened. And so what, what's happened is they probably just lost perspective. Like here's a summary of, right? Here's a summary of, of 16. And maybe you can go, I, I just encourage you to go read just chapter 16 later on. But you have Peter confessing Jesus as the Messiah in 16. After a long day of ministry, they withdraw and Jesus is with all of his disciples and he starts asking them questions. He said, hey, uh, so hey, who does, who, does, who does everybody say that I am? Who do, who's, who do the people say that I am? And they respond, well, like some say you're one of the prophets. Uh, it's funny because one of them are like, well, some say that you're Elijah, which in this case, if you just read, if you just remember, it's like, well, these three are like, well, we know he's not Elijah because that's Elijah right there, apparently. <laughs> like that, so he's not one of the prophets. And then Jesus asks a profound question that I think that should resonate with all of us. He says, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And then later on, Peter's actually rebuked by the Messiah. He's already confessed that he's the Messiah, but Jesus starts saying like, hey, well, you've got to go, uh, I'm, I'm going to go suffer and die. The son of man's going to do that. And he's like, wait, wait, wait. Jesus is like, hey, you can't, or Peter's like, hey, you can't say those things. And Jesus says, no, you can't say those things because what you just said is satanic. Imagine that, right? Now all of a sudden, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, I didn't mean that. 
because he's preventing the Lord's will from actually happening. And then he, he introduces this idea uh, of where if anyone is to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And so Jesus has slowly begun to reveal that he's going to suffer, he's going to die. It also takes a daily, you have to die to yourself daily if you're going to follow me. And they're probably like, is this, is this really what we're doing? Really? And 16.28 says, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom, or until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And this verse sets up the following events. And so you can imagine how the disciples might have felt. There's probably lots of confusion, disillusionment for the disciples, and maybe they had more questions, and maybe they just needed some encouragement. I mean, I mean, really, think about, think about our own context, right? How easy it is for us to just to lose perspective on life, right? Confusion could e easily lead to doubt. It's like, it's like, hey, why, why, okay, why is there a war in Europe right now? Like, really, we're doing this again? We, we thought this was over. We thought this would never happen again. God, are you still in control? You're still reigning, really? Oh, think about your own family life. Why does my mom have cancer? Like, why, why did you let so-and-so die? Why didn't I get into this school? And what God does, he just allows us to lean into those difficult circumstances and ask difficult questions. Because all he wants to do is he just wants to remind us, he wants to say, yes, yes, I'm still king. Yes, I still reign. Yes, I care. Yes, I see you in the middle of the chaos and the confusion. Like Jesus is purely doing this to help his own disciples, right? He's not putting this a part of his bragging montage of just being like, hey, look at this. Woo! Like I can just transform anytime I want to. Like that's not what he's doing here. He's just showing them that's like, he, this, the transfiguration is an act of grace, and he wants to give them a preview of what's to come by providing some clarity with his glory and power. And so these core disciples, as we move into 17, are present with Jesus during some of these major events in his ministry. And again, I just think they lost perspective, but God's gonna, God's gonna help them out. And that's what God does is he gives perspective. That's number two, is that he gives perspective. We lose perspective, but God gives perspective. And so Jesus is now immediately transformed, or there's, there's this metamorphosis that takes place, and he's, he's a bright, glowing light, right? The glory of the Lord engulfs him, and it engulfs, engulfs them, right? That's just like, whoa! Like, I, I find this funny because I, I, I grew up, you know, kind of 90s, early 2000s youth ministry where, like, we go to camp, and we're all sitting around the campfire, and we're singing Kumbaya, right? And we're just trying to access the presence of the Lord, right? And Jesus is just like, bam, transformed. And they hit the ground like, whoa, what is going on? You can't just do that, right? And then Moses and Elijah are all of a sudden just there, and they're just, ha and Jesus is talking with them, and they're like, well, okay, I, all right, now I'm really confused. <laughs> Jesus, what are you doing? And I've wondered this too. I don't know if you wonder this when you read this passage. It's like, how did they know it was Moses and Elijah? Like, is Jesus like, oh, hey, let me introduce you. So this is Moses and this is Elijah. It's like, they just kind of knew, I guess. But Moses and Elijah, they, they represent the two divisions of the Old Testament. Like, yes, there's a, there's, a third, there's a third division. You have the wisdom books. But anytime you summarize the Old Testament, it's with the law and prophets. And so these prominent figures were probably placed above Jesus in the disciples' minds. Like they still had a limited understanding of who Jesus was where they're kind of walking around with kind of blinders on and Jesus is slowly taking them away to say, hey, I'm gonna show you something that's gonna blow your minds. And so you have Moses, he, he equals the law, right? It's the 10 commandments, it's these, it's these other 613 laws, right? So th to these Jewish men, Moses is one of the most important figures in history. And then you have Elijah. I mean, Elijah is the prophet, right? He is the LeBron of prophets, okay? This is the guy. It's like, yeah, we know about you. Like, you never died. 
Like, really, they both had mysterious deaths. Like, Moses is taken away by God and buried somewhere. Like, that's what the Bible tells us. And we're like, okay, these, these, these are the dudes. But the most important thing about this, though, is that both point to Jesus. I'll unpack that here in a second, but all of, all of the law and the prophets point to something greater. The disciples still think that, you know, these are the most important, right? right? But they, they've not give, been given the whole picture yet. Now, yes, Jesus is transformed in front of them, right? But he's this bright light, but why is, why is he standing here talking to the other two? I mean, it's as if they're probably thinking, okay, Jesus led us up the mountain to meet them, right? He was like, oh, hey, I want to introduce you to my buds. And that's when we love Peter, right? If you know anything about Peter, we love Peter because Peter just starts talking. And he just starts telling Jesus, he's like, hey, we could build some tents, right? That's what you did. It was, you're you're going to create a memory, but it's like, hey, all right, okay, so oh, man, this, this is great. Okay, awesome. Um, I'll build a tent, right? We want one here for you and one for, one for Moses and then one, one for Elijah, right? Like, like, like let's, let's create a memory, right? He, like, he's not doing something wrong. He's just doing something really odd. It's kind of like the selfie, right? The selfie is really awkward, right? It's like if I was to pull out my phone right now and I was like, all right, hey, this is the first three rows. Like, I'm going to need you to actually move up, like, to the first row, right? And you're like, okay. I don't really want to get a part of this, but it's like, no, 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 come on. Yeah, we're going to remember this forever. It's awesome, right? And we're taking this selfie, and it's like, no, this is, this is weird, man. Like, Peter's just an influencer in the wild, just trying to make something happen. He's just like, I want to, yeah, this is awesome. And it's, they're like, dude, like, I don't know. I don't really think that's why God starts speaking in verse 5, because he's like, okay, he's going to say something else ridiculous, and I'm just, bam, okay, hey, <laughs> And they hit the ground. They're like, oh, the Lord is here. Okay, never mind. We're done talking. It just overpowers them. And Jesus just says, notice he says the exact same thing at Jesus' baptism. And God adds, listen to him. Perspective. Basically, Jesus must be followed and obeyed. We go, okay, but what, 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 about, what about the law? What about the prophets? Right, are, these, are these no longer relevant? Do we need the Old Testament? I mean, does it really serve a purpose? Right? These, these are legit questions. I'm doing a deeper Bible study with our, with our middle schoolers right now with a few of them on, on Sunday nights. And we, last week we started off looking at, we're just looking at some basics of the faith. And so the first topic was, was the Bible. And one of our middle schoolers asked this question, asked this very same question. It was like, so we don't need the Old Testament anymore, right? I think my question for them was like, okay, wait, what really, what prevents us from actually reading the word, right? And one of them, another one actually said like the book of Leviticus. That's what, that, what's, that is what prevents me from reading. I don't want to read Leviticus. I was like, great. That's a legit question. But to answer the question, these are important because all of scripture points to Jesus. And that's what's happening here. And the Bible's, like a, the Bible's like a mirror, right? You know, when I, when I wake up in the morning, okay, I've, I've got to do something about all this, okay? I've got to fix my, I got to, my breath stinks, right? I've got to fix my hair. I've got to do something about maybe the circles under my eyes or something, right? Like, I've got to fix this, right? The only difference is that, is that the actual mirror is telling me that I'm the solution, When you look at culture, you look at social media, right? It's all pointing back to you going like, hey, you just need to fix yourself. You just, you just you got this, right? And the Bible's, the Bible's similar in that it, it reveals our flaws, but it also points us to the solution. The difference is that I'm not trying to fix all this on my own. And we begin to realize that we actually have these laws. We have some of these things from the, from the Old Testament, right? They help us live but there's no way I can keep the whole law. And so when I fail to keep the whole law, when I fail to honor God, that's what the Bible calls sin and the punishment for that is death. But instead of allowing us to die, God actually gives us his son who upholds and fulfills the law and he dies in our place so that you and I can spend eternity with him. 
God gives us perspective in relation to the story of the Bible. He is the solution. That's what the law and the prophets are repeatedly, repeatedly pointing to. It's Jesus. So it took us a little, a little bit to get here, but in, in verses six through eight, it's, a, it's this beautiful scene of God's grace on display, right? Jesus, Jesus isn't mad that he had to take these three dudes up to a mountain, right? He understands where they are in their journey. And he's just trying to prepare them for some future persecution and what the end game is. And the end game is that Jesus is glorified in the new earth. And you guys get to be a part of this. And so verse six, they're terrified. Verse seven, Jesus in an act of grace and empathy just goes over to them, right? This is the first time he speaks in this whole passage. He just goes over to them. He says, hey, rise, have no fear. Let's go. I mean, Jesus just, just gives such comforting language. And I love verse eight. Just, just star that, highlight, underline, whatever, circle the verse. They saw no one but Jesus only. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. I mean, it's just such beautiful language Matthew uses to describe the scene. The only, I mean, it's added for emphasis. He didn't accidentally put it in there. It's like, man, no, like I'm emphasizing that Jesus, it was only Jesus they saw. And he's going to prove sufficient for their needs. See, perspective is not found in a place. Perspective is found in a person. Jesus and only Jesus. See, we, we need this as much as, as the disciples. I mean, they're going to be put in some, some situations. I mean, some scholars believe in, in really in six months from this point is the crucifixion. Where it's really going to seem like the gospel is not advancing. Or really, go read, go read verse 14. Go read that whole story. When they're coming down the mountain, right? And they're trying to, the other disciples are there trying to cast this demon out of this boy. And you've got the Pharisees there, which I'm sure they're super helpful, right? No. And the lawyers are trying to reach a settlement with the family. It's like, okay, this is, this is chaos. Like, what is going on? And I'm sure the other three disciples are like, hey, like, you just might want to let him do it. Because like, we've seen some things. Or what about even when they all desert him at the cross? Including these three who've seen the glory of the king. See, I want to, I want to be clear. Like these, these disciples are not perfect because of the transfiguration, right? Because they had this mountaintop experience. I mean, they've got to come down the mountain. And they think Jesus is not winning. And they just need some encouragement. And think about your own life again, right? Prayers aren't answered. People stop coming to my connect group. I mean, we got man, another war could break out. Are you serious? I just spent my whole paycheck on a tank of gas. I'm like, really? Like, what is going on? Maybe it's this. Like, you simply just sit down to read God's word. You're like, okay, today is the day I'm going to serve him wholeheartedly. I'm going to serve him with everything I've got. I'm dedicated to God. I'm dedicated to following you. And you wake up 30 minutes later with the Bible just sitting on your lap like this, right? Just it happens. Or you lose it on your kids on the way out the door trying to get them to school or into church this morning, right? It happens. I mean, when, I, I just remember when Lenten season began, or like leading up to Easter, like I committed, committed to pray and fast every Thursday from 11 to 1 o'clock. I think I've done it twice. Just so defeating. Like, man, I, like, wh what is going on? This is the entire Christian life. But this is when Jesus offers us his grace I mean, when we lose sight of who Jesus, of, of Jesus and who he is, it feels just like nothing's, it just feels like nothing's ever going to get better. 
because we're all going to hit just difficulties and challenges. Some of you are in the, some of the most difficult challenges of your life right now. And we just need to remember, Jesus wins. Despite what's happened, Jesus is working in your life and he's working in the world. And that's the perspective God gives. So as they come, start coming down the mountain, right? Verse 9, Peter's kind of like still in influencer mode of like, so I, am I posting this? Like, is this going on? And it's like, no, just, hey, non-disclosure agreement, please, everybody sign. Don't say anything until after the resurrection. I, mean, I don't know how they could keep this to themselves. It's one of the most just bizarre, craziest things they're ever going to experience, but they do. That's why Peter writes about it in 2 Peter 1. And this is what sets up our final point is that we finally, we gain perspective. We lose perspective, but God gives perspective and we gain perspective. Like they've got to come down the mountain, right? You, can't, you cannot stay on the mountain. We are sent into the world. And now that these three disciples kind of know what's, what's, what's happening and what the, what the end looks like, right, they start to really kind of piece some of these things together. They start realizing what's happening. They start asking questions about Elijah. And they, they, that's why that Jesus reminds them of just kind of what's already taken place. I mean, look at G verses 12 and 13. They're just kind of putting two and two together of like, okay, okay, the, the, verse 13 is where their minds are blown. It's like, since, okay, since John, John is the new Elijah, that means you're the Messiah. Peter was right. Like, you're, you're the Messiah. You're it. The forerunner has come. The Messiah is here. All right, it's, it's interesting, right, because we've talked about John the Baptist these, these last three weeks and how he's kind of just tied all of these things together. And again, these three disciples are coming down the mountain with this new perspective, right? It doesn't mean they're perfect. It doesn't mean they never sin again. It doesn't mean that they're not going to face trials. It just, mean, it just means they've got a, they get a glimpse of the glory of the king. I love what Tim Keller says. He says, he puts it, or he puts it this way. He says, the kingdom of God has begun with all its life-giving power and yet coexists with the sin and justice and death of this world until the king comes back the final time to finally and completely restore all things. They get to see the glory of the future king. So what do we, what do, we do with this? How can we capture perspective? How do, we how do we live this out? I think what it comes down to, we've got to figure out how to access the presence of God. I mean, essentially, that's, that's what's happening here. They're, they're getting a glimpse of the presence of God, right? You go back to the Old Testament when, when, when God was on the mountain and, and Moses is going to go talk to God, right? The, the presence of God <laughs> descends upon the mountain and, and it just engulfs the whole thing. And really, that's what we try to recreate here on a Sunday. That's the importance of us coming together as the, as the body because we want everybody to ex experience the presence of God in their own life. But really, what, what, what it comes down to is that the Christian life is really just, it's a daily grind. And you've got to seek the presence of God daily, and you can access his presence Daily, and when I, when I was preparing this message, I was just drawn to, to, to David's words in First Chronicles sixteen eleven: "Seek the Lord and His strength; seek His presence continually." And what we'll find out is that the Lord's presence reveals something to us. Specifically, right, the transfiguration in this moment reveals who Jesus is. It's the future coming of the King and His kingdom. So maybe that means you just maybe that means you just need to switch up your routine. Maybe that means you need to switch up the routine of how and when you spend time with God, right? His his presence is found when you spend time with him. Every time you open the Bible, right? You're you're accessing the the word of God so that he can speak directly to you, right? We focus so much on a place sometimes where we say, "Man, I got to I just got to get away. I just man, if I can get away and get some new perspective, it's like, no. You just got to access the presence of God daily." where he can speak directly to you. 
Again, perspective is not found in a place. It's found in the person of Jesus Christ. Or maybe it means just adding something to your, to your routine, right? We've, we've had the, the chapel open uh, during kind of the Lenten season of just where you can come to the chapel, you can pray from 11 to 1 each day. And I'm not asking you to, I'm not asking you to come uh, up, to, up all, all the way to the chapel. I'm just asking maybe you just need to spend 5, 10 minutes at your desk every day after lunch and just ask God, hey, God, help me to finish this afternoon well. Help me to glorify you in all my meetings. Help me to glorify you in all my work. Right? Sometimes when there's a void, like we just need to add something different to help us reconnect with Jesus and Jesus only. We're real good about connecting right to our phone. It's, it's got all of our social media there. It's got all of our news. I've got all the sports updates that I could ever want. We just need to connect, reconnect with Jesus and Jesus only. And it also may mean you just need to re reconnect with people. Like you just need people. You need friends. And you need friends to just come alongside and help you in your journey. Because other people in your life could just help you gain perspective, right? They can offer encouragement. They can offer insight. They can offer prayer. And they can just help you walk through difficult situations together. And we can help with that too. We're available for that after the service. You can come down. I'd love to chat with you if you need some, maybe it's just where to start. <laughs> or you just need to be connected with some people. I'd love to, I'd love to talk, to you, talk to you about that. But again, we, we sometimes lose perspective of what God is doing, but God graciously gives perspective. And we gain perspective through his presence. All right, so this, this upcoming attraction gives us a, a peek at a, at a future glory. He reveals himself through his word, through other people, and he, he, just, he, desires, he desires for you to experience his presence in your own life. And through his presence, we gain perspective. And perspective is only found in a person, Jesus. Jesus only. Let's pray together. Father God, I'm asking for your presence to be felt among each of the people that are here this morning, those watching online. That God, you give us a reminder that we can access your presence daily. And that God, maybe there, there's those that, that need help accessing your presence daily. So I'm asking that you give, give, those, give, those, uh, give those people uh, friends to help them access your presence. To be encouraged, to, to gain perspective on life, to gain perspective on what, you're, what it is that you're doing. And God, we know that, we, that you're working. We just need to be reminded and we thank you for the grace that you've offered through this story of understanding who you are and what you're doing. And that God, we get a glimpse of the future king in your kingdom. So God, let, let us leave this place, let us leave in awe of you. Let us leave to, to serve you. And God, be, let us be reminded that we can access your presence each and every day. So God, we love you. It's your name we pray. Amen.